broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne. This is Wilms Front, brought to you by the Unshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. We at the Unshackled, we discovered a, a new uh, Australian alt media outlet which we've connected with, uh, Carnage House Productions. Uh, we've had the face of the channel for, for most of this year, Dougal Cameron, on this show. His uh, ginger hair has been on a bit of a uh, publicity tour because he was also on uh, Dear Beltran's live show. Uh, but we've got tonight the, the eldest uh, Carnage House uh, brother, uh, Alex De Zander Cameron. He's just got back from study and homestay in, in mainland China. So obviously what's been going on in uh, China and, and Hong Kong with the pro-democracy protest, I've, I've got him on tonight to do a bit of a interrogation of him. Alexander, nice to meet you. Thank you for having me on, Tim. Um, great to be here and great to finally meet you. Yes, likewise. Now, this has fascinated me that you've been in mainland China for so long because that's basically been what's consumed Australian politics for the past uh, few months. How should Australia approach its future relationship with, with China, which is uh, becoming uh, more ambitious in its... Uh, increasing its sphere of, of influence and increasingly flexing its uh, military and diplomatic muscle. And of course, there's been the, the pro-democracy protests uh, in Hong Kong, uh, which have gone on for, I think we're about in the 16th week of it. And the, the extradition bill, which triggered these uh, protests, uh, that's been formally withdrawn now. But of course, uh, Hong Kong under the the one country two systems when the British handed it back in 1997 to People's Republic of China the 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 democratic uh, liberal uh, system of government was only enshrined for uh, 50 years until 2047 now I've I do listen to uh, your podcast, uh, the, the Rap, uh, which you've made a return uh, to, and I've, I've heard uh, Dougal and, and Andy uh, talk, talk about the, the, the protests, and uh, you and your brother, you spent quite, well, n uh, quite a number of time in, in China, so before uh, going in, in too hard against you, how did you and your brothers become s so accustomed to Chinese culture and end up spending a lot of time there? Sure. Um, well, basically, I uh, finished my uni degree and kind of in the last year of university decided to pick up two Mandarin electives. Um, and so I didn't really take a gap year out of high school or anything like that. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to go overseas, do a little bit of traveling, um, spend kind of six months away. Um, when Dougal had already laid the foundation, laid the groundwork. So Dougal spent, um, I think it was close to two years over there. He received a scholarship from um, Fudan University um, in partnership with the, the Chinese government, which I guess you could say synonymously was the party. Um, and so that's kind of where the, the roots were laid. Um, I had a great time over there. Um, so, and I'm largely sympathetic to to um, kind of the Chinese people in general. Um, so that's kind of where I am. I spent six months kind of learning Chinese as best I could and I've just come back. So um, Dougal really set the foundation and then I've just kind of carried on, if that makes sense. Now, obviously, when uh, the People's Republic of, of China was uh, ruled by, by Mao Zedong, it was a fully fledged uh, communist republic. Uh, it was described as uh, China was living behind the, the bamboo curtain. It was completely cut off from the, the rest of the world. In fact, uh, the United Nations recognized uh, Taiwan as the, the legitimate uh, Republic of China. That's where the, the Kuomintang under uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, fled to when they, they lost the, the civil war. And uh, obviously since Mao's death in 1976, there's been well, at least economic liberalization. There, there was an attempt uh, by students at uh, achieving civil liberties in 1989 in Tiananmen Square, but we all know how, how that ended. And so China, it's become now an economic uh, 
super house, basically going from a communist state to, and I use this term in its proper meaning, a fascist state, which it, the state manages the economy along with uh, private corporations, which has actually allowed it to live, lift millions and millions of people uh, out of poverty, uh, but it is still a, a one-party <clears throat> state uh, with not many political freedoms. Yeah, that's no, that's absolutely right. Um, and you know, obviously, there is a discussion which which often arises, and it's um, the better argument from the kind of the new left, or at least the kind of the the heavy government interventionists, is they point to China, and they say, look what the Chinese were able to do, uh, lifting so many millions out of poverty. Um, government intervention works. Um, if applied correctly. Um, so it's definitely an interesting and new case study um, for kind of the way in which uh, capitalism and kind of government intervention can intersect and, and interact and produce a positive outcome. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to say that that, um, that is the best way to do it. Um, and obviously the, the Chinese people pay us a pretty substantial tax um, as a consequence of this government intervention. Um, but it's certainly a much, it's a much better argument um, than has previously been made for many other socialist countries, I would say. Well, the only legitimately socialist communist countries remaining, uh, well, Cuba and North Korea and, well, Venezuela, uh, that's that's been a late uh, bloomer to the uh, uh, the communist uh, shithole group, if I can be uh, crude. Uh, but yes, obviously, the more uh, capitalism you allow, the more uh, free trade, free enterprise, then of course, you're going to be richer. Uh, but that and China has benefited from that. But in terms of complete freedom for the people, because we do live in the digital age now, and China has been able to implement a f big brother system using the, the power of the internet, for example, all the big tech companies, they're either censored or heavily uh, filtered there. And there's also mass surveillance. So there's a lot being talked about the social credit system <clears throat> that they have, uh, where if you do the the right uh, social and healthy behaviors you get uh, rewarded for it so this is the 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 sinister side of that and of course there's been a lot of uh, scrutiny on in Xinjiang province the the, the Uyghur people who are being put in sure. concentration camps uh, because uh, China obviously sees Islam as a threat but they're taking it uh, doing it and countering it in quite an extreme way. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Um, but uh, I, I would say one of the, the re one of the reasons why you don't see kind of mass demonstrations or, or mass protests against this um, type of operation is that um, I guess for, for whatever reason, the Chinese people writ large have quite a high level of trust for their government officials um, compared to kind of a, a more natural, uh, healthy skepticism that you see kind of throughout the West. Um, the, from the Chinese people that I talk to, they um, have absolute faith in the administrative capabilities of their governments. Um, and they kind of see it almost as the way in which that the government is able to implement their own agenda as and kind of controlling these various aspects of, of, of private individuals' lives as almost taking the burden off their own shoulders just by consequence of the, the high level of trust that they have. Um, overall, you really think that's their their honest opinion, because obviously their things are a lot better than they were thirty years ago. But of course, they're still going to say that uh, we like the the government doing this, and it seems strange that that a people would like governments basically being a a mother and father to them. I mean, certainly a lot of Australians wouldn't like that apart from a lot of the, the nanny state uh, public health lobbies. Sure. Sure. And I, to and I, I totally understand that. Um, and look, this is just kind of from my personal experience and from the Chinese people I talk to is that they um, don't really, at least from what they were, they were giving across, they understand that the government is, is um, 
the extent to which it can infiltrate an individual's life is substantial. They understand that, but the thing is, I think they have a sound, a pretty high level of trust, and it doesn't really, as long as their kind of food is on the table, um, they're not really too too concerned about it. Well, that's probably the same uh, in Australia, as long as you can still quietly uh, live your life, uh, work, uh, raise your family, uh, then you're not going to get much interference from the state. But of course, if you step out of that, uh, then th there's going to be a lot of consequences for that. Yeah, that's true. That's, uh, I, I, and, you know, I would say that um, there is probably a, a reasonable level of fear um, um, that the Chinese people do have um, for the government and the ways in which... Um, they operate, but at, like uh, as far as I could see, there wasn't kind of an active apprehension towards government officials or um, kind of even local security. Um, like you see in in shopping centres, you see kind of even walking around um, districts, police and local officials everywhere out in force, and people um, didn't seem to be particularly phased by them. They didn't seem to be particularly weary of them. Um, you know, I would say that, um, like, when I see a, a, a police officer in, in Sydney, I'm not scared of him per se, but I, I'm, you know, it's kind of like when a police officer is driving behind you, you do get that little sense of they're going to get me for something. Um, you know, whether it's jaywalking or, or, or littering or not that I live, but whatever it is. Um, the Chinese people didn't really um, operate under that kind of um, cloud of suspicion at all, as far as I could tell. Well, we are a bit uh, fascist in, in Australia in various states and at, at federal level. So uh, that's a sort of good comparison you make there. There's, I put the entropy link in the, the chat again. Uh, so uh, if you want to uh, send uh, through a super chat or ask uh, either Alex or I uh, a question, because uh, we are... It can, it, for everyone who's not aware, uh, Wilmsfront uh, live streams, they are exclusively on the, the Tim Wilms channel, but we also use the enhanced uh, YouTube uh, software, which is Entropy, which allows to cut around the requirement to have a thousand subscribers to, to receive super chats and be monetized. So first question of the evening is from Senator Slow, who says, who's this nerd? I'm not sure. I, I, he's probably talking about me because uh, I'm the one uh, with the glasses. Yeah, I was going to say, who's he talking to? <laughs> yeah. Well, I can always, I can, I can take them off. I've got some. I've got some. They're just not here. I'm just not wearing mine. Mine yeah. are um, reading glasses. Yeah, I did. I did a bit of Facebook stalking of you. I noticed you got glasses in a few of them. A couple. Yeah. 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 I've never understood why people call them seeing eye glasses. Do you understand what that means? Seeing eye glasses. That you're blind. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I don't know. Mum, you know, mum would often say, "Can someone fetch me my seeing eyeglasses?" I don't know if some of you, some of your listeners, can fill me in on that because that's just what I assume gla normal glasses are. Just whilst we're on the topic, yeah. And we should mention that uh, Dougal's your producer uh, for the evening. He's managed not to basically hog the because he has been basically why why you've been gone, been the the, the face of. Of Carnage House doing all the interviews, getting getting out there. He's been, so pour, he's been pouring himself out basically mm. to anyone that'll anyone that'll take him. Um, but he's been doing good work. He's been doing good work. But uh, you've been uh, while you're in China, you've been uh, writing because uh, Carnage House it has its own website now with a blog, and we've republished uh, a few of them on the Unshackled, which we'll, we'll discuss uh, some of those at the the back end of the show. Sure. Yeah, no, it was very kind of you to offer to uh, publish them. Um, I was, you know, I had a bit of spare time, so I thought um, one of the ways that I could contribute since I wasn't on the wrap anymore was to, to write a couple of things. Um, and so, but, you know, the, the feedback was generally pretty good, as far as I could tell. Yeah, I, as they certainly got me thinking about uh, a lot of the the, the topics that, that you were writing about. It was refreshing, I'll, I'll say that. But, well, that's uh, very confident. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when, we're not uh, going to get sidetracked from <laughs> the main <laughs> issue here. So obviously you've been in mainland China, and as I mentioned, the, the question in Australian politics is how do we deal... Uh, with uh, this new economic and military 
uh, superpower of uh, China, given it is a, a one-party system and President Xi Jinping, uh, to, to use the, the more polite term, he's been elected uh, president uh, for life. There's been a lot of uh, talk about the, the various uh, Chinese community groups that uh, exist in mainly Melbourne and Sydney suburbs, which are heavily Chinese uh, populated, and we've had the, the first Chinese Australian MP elected to the House of Representatives, Gladys Liu, uh, for the seat of Chisholm, which is it's actually not too far from uh, this studio. It has quite a, a heavy uh, ethnic Chinese population. Her Labour opponent, Jennifer Yang, uh, at the federal election was also uh, Chinese Australian. And it, it came out after the election that both Gladys Liu and Jennifer Yang were members of various commerce uh, uh, associations in the, the local area, which ultimately were linked to uh, China's United Front, uh, which is, is basically China's foreign influence arm. And they've got their, their hands on a lot of these, these Chinese friendship uh, groups. Uh, my first question is to you, are you a member of any Chinese association in Australia? Uh, unequivocally, no, I'm not. I'm not. However, I'm keen to keen to uh, join a few. If anyone knows of anyone, mm, that's interesting. That you're still willing in the current climate to say you'd like to join. Yeah, uh, I'm keen to. Um, I think Chinese uh, Australian relationships are absolutely pivotal, and I'm keen to contribute where I can. But obviously, uh, we've seen the pro-Hong Kong demonstrations uh, in mm. Australia by, well, they, they have been attended by many white local Australians, but they've been driven by, there's a large uh, Hong Kong uh, community here in, in Melbourne and Sydney. And at a lot of those rallies, there's been this sudden surge of pro uh, Chinese Communist Party or People's Republic of China or One China people who've come in quite aggressively to shout them down. And it was the yeah. University of Queensland that was actually uh, punching on there. And it's been well documented that those pro-Chinese uh, students or other people, they didn't just get there on their own. They 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 had a had a bit of help. And a lot of the, the Hong Kong, uh, pro-Hong Kong demonstrators were f facial masks because they're worried about uh, being recognized by the Chinese authorities or they've got family uh, back home. So that is obviously quite sinister that even though a lot of them are Australian citizens, sole Australian citizens, they've still got this shadowy force following them. Yeah, I don't, I don't look, I, I obviously, I, you know, I can't speak to the extent to which um, being recognised in Australia would directly impact um, your family standing or social credit store back in China. But obviously, you, you, I can understand their, their hesitancy to um, show their face. Um, for the, I'm not a massive fan of people wearing masks in public, but I'm equally not a fan of government spying. So I hold those two things kind of um, of equal weighting. Uh, in fact, probably the government intervention even more so. I, I, I'm weary of. So I, I sympathise with them, and I understand. Um, I, t I totally understand why um, there are substantial demonstrations. Um, by uh, Hong Kong Australians as well as um, Chinese Australians. Uh, one, of, one of the things I get sceptical about is if we are going to go into this issue, and to be honest, in fairness, I don't actually really know, apart from the, the whole thing about the ex extradition, why there is uh, kind of these ongoing protests. Um, but I always get sceptical when the there is unity amongst uh, the media as to a, a position. So kind of there was very, very little pro-Chinese um, or at least representation of the Chinese side of the argument within Australian media and Western media in general, particularly when this was going around, um, when it kind of the protests first began. Um, so I always get extremely sceptical about the kind of the, the intentions behind it. Um, you know, it used to be said that when both sides agree, you prepare, you know, kind of get the lubrication out because there's going to be an extra big one coming your way. Um, 
if you talk to the Chinese, the Chinese are obviously very passionate about it and the Chinese Australians uh, are obviously going to be because they, uh, many of them are first or second generation Chinese and they're going to have um, strong familial links back to the homeland. Um, well, what is the, the, the pro-Chinese argument? If you're saying it's not getting a, a, a fair hearing, then there's your, uh, um, I'll give you an opportunity now to explain it. Sure, and as I said, I'm not, I, I don't claim to be an expert, but the, the, the Chinese argument, so far as I can tell, is that it's it's always been Chinese. It was kind of taken taken by the British. Um, it was never really, and never really properly returned. So you have a lot of people with deep Chinese roots there, um, and Chinese uh, kind of, you know, invested a, a, a fair amount in Hong Kong. So they're saying, well just because the, the British left and, and the Westerners left and kind of left it to Hong Kong doesn't really mean that it becomes a non-Chinese territory. Well, Hong Kong, uh, they were one of the Asian tigers economies while uh, People's Republic of China was behind the, the bamboo curtain. So they did pretty well uh, on their own uh, post uh, World War II uh, to uh, the handover. So I don't think that that China invests in Hong Kong really holds credence. Okay, and, sure, and look, I, 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 I'm, I'm happy to yield on, on the economics of it, but I, I, my understanding is that there, are, there, there have been quite strong links between China and Hong Kong for, for a substantial period of time. And, and look, I, I'm not proposing that the, that the Chinese argument is correct, or that it is, um, you know, by any means stronger than stronger than the Hong Kong argument. However, I just become sceptical when kind of the accusations, uh, as you mentioned, that kind of these Chinese people are being, um, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure if you said paid or, or, or um, supported. Um, assisted had, to the demonstrations. Assisted, assisted to the demonstrations. There's been, I've heard, for, I actually heard from a number of Chinese people that there is big money behind the Hong Kong protesters from the university, particularly the university students. And in fact, that many of the, the demonstrators were getting paid. Pro Hong Kong Pro -Hong democracy. Kong. Where were they getting paid from? I don't know. I don't know. The reason why I'm going pretty hard on you is because you're putting forward what's a very unfashionable position uh, at the moment. I I'm trying to give you an opportunity to explain it sure. as well. And now That's Taiwan, uh, it's uh, People's Republic of China, their one China policy covers Taiwan as well. And as I mentioned, that's where the Chinese nationalists fled after they lost the, the, the Chinese Civil War. It's, it's been, uh, it was originally a dictatorship, now it's a democracy, uh, but it's, it's in a gray area at the moment that because it's called the Republic of China, then People's Republic of China is okay with that. But there is a Taiwanese nationalist movement who want to create a separate Taiwanese identity. And China has said that if it changes its name to the Republic of Taiwan, then that's will move in. Does Taiwan belong to China? Is it part of China? I don't know. I don't know. I, I honestly couldn't tell you. But I, Hong, I'm Kong, not gonna... Hong Kong belongs to China in, in your opinion. Not in my opinion. I'm not saying that. I, my my scepticism was just simply that uh, the Hong Kong, the, the the Chinese argument wasn't really hadn't been represented at all. That's my that was my scepticism. I wasn't I wasn't by any means holding up the Chinese flag and saying putting a stake in the ground in Hong Kong. Um, and to, and you know if, if the Chinese and the, and the Taiwanese they they can sort it out themselves. I'm happy for them to sort it out. And you also omitted or didn't comment uh, when I mentioned the, the Uyghur people in Xinjiang province. Is that, are those human rights violations? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, of course. I'm not, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and pretend as if, as if the Chinese are without blemishes and without faults and, you know, uh, they, they've just had a, a totally unfair and bad rap. Of course. I think, I, like, uh, of all the practices, I absolutely condemn that. A hundred percent. Yeah, unequivocally, Carnage House does not, um, you know, advance the proposition that it's good to hold um, ethnic minorities in in detention centres. Good. Uh, this is all uh, on the record, which is why I'm asking on the these record. questions. Uh, going back to Australia's relationship uh, with China, because we 
obviously uh, in the Asia Pacific region, China has a population of over a billion people. Uh, most of our manufacturing has uh, been outsourced to China. And uh, obviously uh, there has been the Australian government and both the Labour opposition, they haven't had a firm position on the, the pro Hong Kong democracy protest uh, because they, they realised that China, because there's not just uh, conventional military warfare anymore, there's trade warfare, which uh, Trump, he's, for example, he, he, he doesn't like military war, but he's more than happy to engage in, in trade uh, warfare. And that is one of the reasons why the Australian government doesn't want to upset the Chinese Communist uh, Party uh, too much. Uh, but uh, this uh, conundrum for the Australian government, it was, it was turbocharged a few months ago when uh, Liberal backbencher and former SAS officer Andrew Hasty uh, wrote uh, in the, the Fairfax papers that uh, we need to uh, have a, a, a clear understanding of the, the military threat that uh, China poses and deal with it appropriately. Otherwise, we'll, we'll make the same uh, mistakes in the past. And obviously, the, the human rights aspect is, is one thing which we've already talked about. But then there's the, the economic argument, which is why the Australian government is, is umming and ar arring. And like, obviously, international trade is important, but we cannot afford to be uh, basically become a colony of China where we are completely dependent on them for our future prosperity and especially when we're not able to stand up for ourselves. For example, uh, China is engaging in checkbook diplomacy in the Pacific Islands. Uh, that, that, that's why uh, they've been so hostile uh, to us at the recent uh, Pacific Islands uh, Forum. So they're, they're coming into our sphere of influence as well. And I'm an Australia first person. I don't want to be pushed around by any uh, foreign nation. Sure, and that's fair enough. Uh, that's fair enough. But um, uh, what I would say is, um, firstly, on the human rights abuses, I mean, yes, of course, uh, China uh, perpetuates substantial and is ongoing and it's actually been documented. But we can't pretend for a moment that if we're prepared to take money and we're pre prepared to trade with the United States, that all of a sudden um, that that somehow uh, alleviates their uh, human rights abuses and uh, and kind of um, their... their their history with, with with that type of thing. I think um, I agree that we should try and be as independent as we can. And I think if there is ever an argument for, um, you know, encouraging business and um, financial independence, that's it. Um, but I don't think just uh, I, I think that the the argument that somehow um, it's a binary proposition, either we we just side with China or, or, or America. I don't think it holds. I don't think it holds. And um, I think it's also quite a dangerous um, perception to be putting out that just by consequence of human rights abuses. If we were go to go through every single country who's perpetuated human rights abuses and say we're not going to trade with them, good luck um, trading with anyone is what I would say. Well, I'd say that China's human rights abuses are a bit worse than some of the, the other nations. I don't agree with the, the comparison to the United States. Obviously, they've committed war crimes overseas, but the people, citizens of the United States, are quite free. You can say anything you want about the president of the United States, which has been on stark display uh, these past uh, three years. Sure, there there are differing levels of freedom within the country, but um, if you if we were going to put on if, if, if the extent to which the government has not engaged in any kind of debauchery or, or, or otherwise questionable illegal um, awful uh, you know tactics, then um, you you're not going to be able to trade. Oh, well, I'm not saying that we cut off all trade with China. I'm just just saying that we should not be in this situation where we're. De completely dependent on them and can't stand up for ourselves uh, in terms of our sphere of influence, our own economic, because that's what a lot of people uh, fear, that if China turns off the tap, then Australia will go into recession just like that. Sure, and that's almost certainly going to happen. Um, but that, that, 
that like I mean fear that the that the Chinese are going to turn off the tap basically says that you haven't done enough as a country to um, proliferate trade between um, you yourself and other countries and the government should be working hard to ensure that by consequence of offering attractive propositions to other countries that um, we can maintain our own independence. If we if we offer an, an attractive enough product, the Chinese the Chinese are, I, I I believe are pragmatic enough not to turn off the tap. Chinese have enough worries as it is. In the last uh, twenty four hours, uh, Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews he has formally signed up to China's uh, One Belt One Road uh, global infrastructure program, which uh, he's been condemned for that of of continuing this uh, economic in interdependence and, of course, uh, 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 turning uh, turning a blind eye to China's uh, human rights abuses, which we don't have to go into that again. I'm just saying that's the perception. What's uh, what, what do you make of uh, Daniel Andrews signing that trade deal? Um, I haven't seen I haven't seen the trade deal, but um, you, know what, one, you know what one about one road is. Yeah, but you know uh, that sounds surprisingly pragmatic from Daniel Andrews, who's normally um, you know in the Socialist Republic of Victoria. I'm I'm happy to see he's doing a, doing a deal for baby sub infrastructure. Um, look, uh, I, I have I haven't really seen I haven't really seen the deal the details of the deal, but um, Australians and Australian governments should be looking to do the best deal for their people. I think regardless basically of who it comes from, because as soon as you start choosing um, based on some kind of subjective characteristics, you're going to find yourself in hot water. Now, we'll finish off this topic. I'll, I'll give you the Andrew Bolt question to Gladys Liu. Alexander Cameron, sure. are you an agent of the Chinese Communist Party? Um, I'm not. Not currently, at least. Okay. So I'll ask you again, maybe in six months. Ask me, ask me in six months. Ask me after this interview. I'm sure that, you know, my, my WeChat might be heating up a little bit. You are on WeChat? I'm a, I am on WeChat. I have a, a, an account with the Chinese bank. I will declare it all up front. Um, I love WeChat Pay. It's fantastic. Well, the the Chinese government they are watching uh, WeChat, but then again, most Western security agencies are watching Facebook, uh, which they're is... watching what you send on message as well. They're watching yeah. everything. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.